Welcome to Pop and Lock. I'm Natalie Dalzicki. And I'm Landry Ayers. Fairy tales come in all shapes and sizes. They're not always about returning glass slippers, poison apples, and flying carpets. Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth is a brilliant mix of reality and fantasy. Today, to discuss the Academy Award-winning 2006 film, is Libertarianism.org's own intellectual history editor and host of the Portraits of Liberty podcast, Paul Meany. Hello. Philosophy MA student at Queen's University, Akiva Malmet. Hey. And PhD candidate in the Department of Economics at George Mason University, Alex Craig. Hi there. Fairy tales, which are obviously a huge theme and crucial plot point in Pan's Labyrinth, are explicitly magical folk tales, usually separated from our world or ones that take the character away from our world. You know, think Alice in Wonderland or Wizard of Oz. But they still have inherent moral themes or prescripts that apply to our world generally. Um, the, the Brothers Grimm, for instance, explicitly rejected stories that were not purely German in their oral history, uh, giving rise to this sort of notion of romantic nationalism and the power of folklore uh, in creating a, a, a nationalist identity, which is also a big part of this story. So what do you think del Toro was trying to say about nationalism and fascism and what the power of fairy tales are with Pan's Labyrinth? Well, whenever I think of like myths and folklore, I also think of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. And he talks about myths as if a way to like get outside of circumstance and analyze things from a more universal point of view. I think Pan's Labyrinth is one of those simple stories complicated because there's two stories going on at once, but it's about good versus evil, quite simply. But it's about how they're portrayed. And fascism is quite often about aesthetics. Like, the actual fantasy parts of the world are actually quite disgusting and gross, and the fawn looks weird, and the toad's disgusting, and the pale man is really, really creepy. But then, like, all of the fascist soldiers, like, say what you will about them, all the uniforms are looking crisp and clean. They're always constantly cleaning themselves meticulously. The fairy tale aspect and the real world aspect collide, and they're actually both the same. They're both quite cruel realities. Yeah, I think about the the sort of crispness of their uniforms, particularly in, in not just in the costume design of the the captain and all of the the soldiers and everything, but also in the sound design. Um, whenever the captain is on screen for most of the film. Um, especially at the beginning, you know, he's constantly fixing his gloves and he's got these big, dark leather boots uh, and these like straps and like a, a sort of a, a belt and, and all the sort of military uh, trappings that go along with that uniform. And you hear this like creaking and uh, like tightening leather sound, even when he's not directly on screen, but when he's in the scene, such that there is this like tightening it it's i mean it's odd but there is definitely a sort of bondage domination sound design aesthetic that is going on in that and that also is evident in the way that there is definitely like a an an erotic tinge to his like domineering and uh, the way that he talks to um, specifically mercedes and when he is torturing people um there is a a, a charge to that to those interactions that it seems that he is enjoying the violence that he is enacting on these people in a way um not that you know bondage in and of itself is the issue it is the pure uh, sort of enjoyment of the displeasure of the people that he's inflicting it on that makes it so uh so sinister and eerie um and it's it's really i i did not catch it until this time but it just the creaking of his gloves whenever he's on screen immediately gave me this sort of visceral reaction um and and he doesn't treat other people like that like whenever he's just going about business and he's talking mostly to his wife and ophelia he's very cold and kind of direct and almost flippant or you know he doesn't really pay them much attention but when the cruelty is uh 
something that he enjoys and he knows he will get to sort of indulge that violent side of him he takes his time it's a little bit almost like a sort of a cat and mouse game to him when he is like when he goes to mercedes and is describing uh how it's funny he says that the everything else was busted but that the key unlocked the lock they didn't blow it open he could outright just go up to her and be like i know what you did but he doesn't he enjoys pressuring and putting that displeasure on her um and and so you can see that in the reactions as well as the way that he is depicted physically and orally so um i wanted to pick up a little bit on what paul was saying earlier about the cleanliness of the uniforms and the methodicalness of of the captain compared compared with the the sort of grossness of, of the fantasy fantasy world and i think what's kind of interesting about this to connect to your opening question um, about nationalism and fascism, right, is that nationalism and fascism are always uh, mythologies, right? They're this kind of story about who we are, but it's not really who we are in a kind of real material sense. It's our kind of spiritual essence, our spiritual selves, and, and who we could be in a certain kind of way. It's an aspirational kind of ideology, and it, but it concretizes it through stories and myths about some kind of primeval past about how and and our origin story and the purity of that and the need to return to that and it's co constantly trying to to return to that by making life more than real life by making it this kind of grand dramatic thing and so it lends itself really easily to um just the general idea of fantasy and also it, it gets into this interesting question about what fantasy is and what reality is um because if you think about for the um, for the soldiers and for the captain, right? What's really real is this war that they're fighting and this cruelty that they're enacting in order to achieve like this more pure, this, this like pure state um, and this utopia. And the the kind of softness of women and of Ophelia's fantasies or whatever is what's supposed to be like not really real. Um, and what's really real is this is this kind of um, violent aesthetic and this, and this attempt to achieve this sort of pure state. And so it gets into this interesting question about, um, what is, what is sort of really real or what's really important, um, or what's really valuable in life, um, in this, in these sort of contrasting things between this, the supposed reality of fascism versus the fantasy that Ophelia lives in or that other people, or that the non-fascists live in. Yeah, and kind of bouncing off of that, it's the the way the film, there's like this fluidity between um, reality and like the reality and the fantasy world in a way that is like, it, it's, it comes through the protagonist, which is a child. Um, and I think I had, I had written down like the importance of the protagonist being like a child in this sense, mind you, cause she does go into the fantasy world and it's very Alice in Wonderland like, um, in the sense that, um, she gets like immersed and then comes back um, into reality. But I think it's also the fluidity is not, it, it, it is slightly like there, there are holes. I wouldn't say it's perfect, um, but they're the way that uh, she experiences the fantasy and then gets, we get put back into reality and we can see the parallels between the two is like, first of all, what the movie's like super famous for also that it like does it in a way that's almost teaching her like the young protagonist, like how to cope with the way reality is um, and kind of like making the parallels are helping her to understand because it's clear that she doesn't understand necessarily what's going on in the context of uh, the Spanish Civil War here. But it's very interesting how the fantasy the fantasy aspect is almost used to enlighten her on reality um and the fluidity between the two is is really excellent i think the really pivotal scene for that sort of fluidity and the parallels that help ophelia navigate her world is the banquet scene with the fascist captain vidal where he is, you know, seated at the front of the table and, you know, he has all his guests and his wife is more or less there as a prop for him. Um, you know, this priest is right at his uh, side and is saying, you know, the people don't need to worry about their bodies. 
even though the fascists are saying that they're going to take care of their bodies, the priest just says, God has already saved their souls, so they just need to be more careful about their bodies and not worry so much. Um, and while all of that's happening, and, and the doll is actually explicit in that scene and says, you know, I want to be here at the birth of a new, clean, fascist Spain. Uh, Ophelia's out getting dirty, you know, crawling around in the mud in the middle of this, you know, bombed out or, you know, lightning struck or something tree, uh, feeding a giant frog that then, you know, disgorges its entire content contents. Like her escape is into the dirt and the mud, but then also paralleling that scene, or perhaps the frog quest is sort of contrasting with the scene, but parallel with the scene is her quest with the pale man, who's also sitting at the front of this banquet and wants to sort of consume everyone and has, um, you know, a kind of gross and flabby body, but everything around him is actually very orderly, right? The the banquet in front of him is actually, you know, very... Uh, cleanly arranged so that, you know, all of the food is still sitting on the table, nothing spilling off, all that kind of thing. And as she takes some of that, she's punished for it, for participating, for trying to have access to this bounty. And so I think those, those parallelisms are really apparent in those, you know, three parts of the movie. And the whole feast scene, there's like the toad that eats all the bugs, but then there's also Vidal and his like co-conspirators, I guess, and fascism. And how they can have massive banquets while everyone else is being rationed to. Then there's also the Pale Man, but all of them are consuming something. And it reminds me of, because Guillermo del Toro is constantly referencing tons of different fairy tales all at once. And so like he could be referencing Kronos, who was the Greek Titan. He used to eat his own children. But he also represented kind of like the ravages of time. And that gets even more credence when you start thinking about Vidal and his clock that he keeps on him at all times. And how he wants his son to know the time he dies at the end of the film. And then the worst that he has the worst fate possible of his name not being remembered. And fascism is all about this kind of long-standing tradition, as Akiva already talked about. One of the other things and the other myths that I think comes up a lot and is sort of about the, the parallels between is uh is the fawn, who is obviously a, a figure in myth and, and folklore. Um, and the identity of the fawn and its intentions is also really, really important to the story as well, because it it sort of vacillates between two extremes. And like a lot of depictions of sort of fae, like creatures in fairy tales, they are guided by intense emotions and not at all, not are not all explicitly untrustworthy, but um, uh are tricksters in a certain sense and uh, are also guided by uh, strong emotions. So the fawn is, is sort of pledging fealty to Ophelia at the very beginning uh, and is, is sort of is so excited to finally meet her. And then when she breaks the rules and eats the grapes in the pale man's banquet hall, he flies into a fit of rage. And then at the end, when he's asking for the brother's blood, he is being like, you have to do this, only to, we find out at the end, by not spilling the blood of the innocent, he plays a trick on her and she actually passes the test and goes to, on to the, uh, the sort of underground kingdom where her father is um, and, and lives on with him there. So there is this kind of unease about what the fawn's intentions are and what sort of who he is and you get that also because he is played by the same actor that plays the pale man doug jones who is a, a really famous and really phenomenal uh sort of creature actor that you've probably seen so many different times and don't even realize it you know shape of water hellboy he obviously gets along with guillermo del toro very well um <laughs> but he's he's just really phenomenal and does amazing sort of creature acting and things like that um so you've got there, – there's some interpretations that perhaps the Pale Man is sort of a manifestation of or another form, a visage of the fawn and that he is sort of playing these games with these tasks for Ophelia. Um, but there's also the confusion about who the fawn itself is. So the English title that we know it by is Pan's Labyrinth. 
but the original title in Spanish is The Labyrinth of the Fawn. And Guillermo del Toro has specifically said the fawn itself is not actually Pan, the god. Um, and, and the sort of difference between the sort of Roman fawn and the Greek satyr is, I think, an interesting tension because you in the old myths, satyrs themselves, which are what people generally think of when they think of fawns, actually, the sort of half goat men, are very lecherous and sort of party boy goats um they're not the you know they're not the polite mr tumness who's gonna invite you into his like snowy cabin and and give you tea like they're <laughs> they want to rage um right. and then the the sort of roman uh fawn was dumbed down a little bit they still share a lot and the romans obviously kind of uh, subsumed a lot of those uh, symbols into their mythology like they did with a lot of gods. But there is a sort of tension between what is the fawn and what does he do that Ophelia has to combat. And I think by calling it Pan's Labyrinth, but it not being Pan explicitly, there is that unease in the audience that makes you think like, well, is he this god? Is he this sort of weird, creepy guy that's going to misuse me for, you know, mischievous ends? Um, and at first I was kind of annoyed. I was like, well, it's not Pan. Why do they call it Pan's Labyrinth? But now I think <laughs> I see a bit of a point, even if it was unintentional. Another potential parallel that immediately comes to mind is the parallel between the fawn and the doll, right? So these are both characters that want people to obey them, right? Or Ophelia to obey them. Um, so Vidal obviously wants everyone to obey him because he has this domineering fascist personality and Ophelia is part of this larger plan and she doesn't understand what's going on. And in, in the Fawn's case, it's a bit, it's a bit less like, um, you know, she's doing it for the sake of some cause that she's unimportant to and more because she wants to be liberated and, you know, rejoin her family or this myth family that she's got. Um, but there's an interesting subversion in the Fawn case where in the Vidal, in, you know, in the case of Captain Vidal, all, all that's interesting, Ophelia is like an unimportant, um, you know, secondary figure. And that's not just true for her, but it's true for women and for anyone fascism sees as weak. Um, whereas the obedience in, in the case of the Fawn, um, is actually because Ophelia is supposed to be very important and her, and her actions make a difference. Um, and so there's a kind of interesting question about when, when obedience makes sense and whether obe the kind of obedience that's being asked for, um, what kind of deal you're being offered, basically. Like, are, are you obeying this because your will is less important, um, or your interests are less important than some, for some larger collective goal, which is obviously the goal of fascism, um, compared with, um, the deal that the foreign officer, which is that, you know, she'll end up um, in this great situation and whether in fact she will or not. Um, and so there's an interesting kind of contrast there about what kinds of fealties are being demanded and what sort of um, place individual people or people who are considered lesser have in different realms. And I think related to that, the fawn kind of plays this bridging role in several different respects. You know, the, the fawn is half human, half animal. The fawn is Ophelia's means of access to her, you know, uh, life as Princess Moana. The fawn is both someone to be obeyed, but also by his own, you know, explicit admission in the final quest, someone to be disobeyed. And so he, this bridging role between the characters that sort of represent obedience, like Captain Vidal, and the characters that sort of represent disobedience like Ophelia or Mercedes is really interesting. And maybe that bridge also then between the, the Roman conception of Pan and the Greek conception of the satyrs is an element in that. I think it's interesting to pick up on that also in terms of not just the satyr fawn comparison, but just the general idea of fawns and other kinds of mythical creatures as these means of access to a reality that we can't quite get to in these sort of transitional spaces, right? So if, if we think about the 
the book that he gives her, which gives her instructions for her quest and and and, um, and advice and so on. It's called the Book of the Crossroads. And in mythology, crossroads are sort of this famous device for places of transition, uh, ways that places that people transfer between worlds. Sometimes they're entrances to the underworld. I think in Greek mythology, um, they're places where criminals are buried in like medieval England. Um, so they, they represent these kinds, this kind of magical in between transitional space. Um, and the fawn is like the creature as a creature of the crossroads or as a creature of this like transitional space represents this kind of duality, um, of, um, of, of, of or dialectic that, that, that I think Alex is highlighting. And it's interesting, Akiva, you bring up this like idea about like choice and choice and obedience, because like, that's really like when you nailed, um, when you boil down the rest of the film, like it's really about this idea of like holding your moral ground versus like what choices you, what choices do you make? And like, what do you pay for them? Uh, because throughout the, throughout the film, uh, she's obviously making all these choices on her quest and she is like at the end trying to decide, you know, uh, do I like sacrifice my brother in a sense, or like, how do I become princess again? And there's all, all of that that happens in like the fantasy world. But then there's also a lot of like choice and obedience that happens with Mercedes and like reality. And like back again, back to the parallels that happen. Um, it makes a little bit more sense to me why it could be boiled down for like, especially for a child protagonist, for it to be about choice and like disobedience, like a uh, trusting authority, let's say that. Um, but at the same time, uh, the fawn never really like gained authority over her. Like it was never clear why that was, but you can see the same parallels with Mercedes and Captain Vidal is that Mercedes is going through like the same thought process, the same decision-making process in reality uh, about whether or not to stay like obedient or, um, and having like perceiving to have these choices, um, when it comes to like her family, her son, her daughter. Um, and I just think that the, again, that parallels super interesting that it comes up, choice comes up in fantasy world and then in reality. Yeah. And the idea of choice comes up with the Dr. Ferrero when he euthanizes one of the characters who was being tortured. And he has the quote where he says, to obey just like that for obedience sake, without questioning, that's only something people like you do. And he's saying it to Vidal. And Vidal at one point says, like, why don't you obey me? There is no one above me. Oh, no, it's when he's torturing the poor guy with the stutter. Uh, he says, you can leave if you count to three. And he says, no one's going to contradict me. There's no one above me. And you can start to see, like, the way he thinks about fascism is that it's basically everyone automatically does exactly what you say. While everyone else in the movie starts, there's, I think, the movie is separating the characters in two sections, the ones who obey and then the ones who disobey. And so like Ophelia's mother has to obey. She doesn't really have much of a choice in the matter. And even Mercedes to an extent has to obey in a day to day basis, but she has her small rebellion in the corner, like away from everyone's sight. She's not like one of the explicit people going off fighting, but she's like kind of a civil disobedience almost. And it's also like, it's the disobedience she can do in like the context of her environment, right? So we've kind of hinted at that, like women in this film, women in this film are treated like pretty, pretty poorly, um, which is like a, a obviously a tenet of uh, fascism to begin with. But um, you can see kind of how Vidal treats his, um, his pregnant wife and also how he talks about the baby um, because there's this like whole Th there's this whole part when uh, the doctor comes and Vidal is convinced that his his ba the baby is a boy and the doctor is like well how would you know that and he just talks about how it has to be a boy and like this whole idea of like continuing on his his father's legacy all that kind of stuff and then there is also a part in the very beginning um, when they're getting out of the the carriage and uh, she meets Captain Vidal for the first time um, the mother is telling her to call her father which is which is weird because first of all, it, it's her stepfather. And second of all, like they've never met like this. It's like this weird encounter. And he's like super like standoffish to the young girl. And I think that kind of just led up to more and more like, uh, the more disrespect Captain Vidal in particular had for women, um, and especially like a woman carrying his child. Um, I could only imagine if the child was a girl, how the woman would have been treated. Um, and like literally her only value is that she had his son, 
Um, and that's why she like, and it was very clear, obviously at the end that he didn't care if the mom, if the mom lived just as long as the boy, um, could, uh, the boy survived the like tumultuous pregnancy. And in that introductory scene where Ophelia and Vidal are meeting, he actually says to his wife, Carmen, um, you know, I want you to use this wheelchair. She says, I don't want to use it. Uh, he whispers in her ear, do it for me. And, you know, that's a phrase that's sometimes used to say, all right, I think this is what's best for you. So even if you don't think it's what's best for you, hey, please do it for me. But since he's already drug her out to this sort of middle of nowhere outpost on the front lines of the remaining fight against the rebels, it doesn't seem to actually be about, hey, I think this is what's best. The doctors think it's what's best. Please do it. It seems to just be, you know, submit to my will in front of all the other soldiers. Show them that you are, you know, just my wife, you are obedience, you are less than me, you are literally sitting down, even as we're walking into our home, you are below me. It's not about taking care of her, else you wouldn't have drug her out there against the doctor's wishes in the first place. I know like a few people have brought up this idea of the watch. And like, so the watch his, I believe it was like, was it his father or him that like wanted to wanted to break the watch so they would know his son would know the exact time that he died it was his right. father that's that's the story that he hears at the the dinner where uh the priest says all that stuff about don't worry about your bodies uh one of the guys says did i ever tell you i met your father and proceeds to tell this story about how he he broke his watch because he wanted his family to know the moment he died but then interestingly enough the captain then says it's it's a lie that he never carried a watch um, and sort of contradicts that. But then we explicitly see that he does it and it's, it's definitely supposed to be his father's watch. So I was kind of curious um, about that, especially because I, I had read something somewhere where they described how his room, like where he was shaving and where he walks around it, the, the set design is made to kind of, resemble the inside of the watch well i think his his quarters or his meeting room are the inside of the mill like the actual mechanical inner workings of the you know windmill that is grinding the flour presumably there which no one lives in those that's not normal that's a very strange place to live so it, you know it really reinforces this image of him as you know obedience in charge of this unthinking machine, this, you know, mechanistic worldview of him on top of everyone else. I think it also, just to pick up on that, it highlights that this interesting thing in the way that he operates, and I guess fascism more generally, which is like perfect control and then unbelievable violence and cruelty. And and there, it's, it's in this very kind of precise manner right so when he tortures people he plays with them like it's you know like he's hunting them or like their food or whatever and he tries to, to like really be cruel to them and he does in this very precise way right so when he kills that innocent farmer with the bottle he like smashes his face in this very precise exact way and he's always obviously he's always checking the watch as alex said he lives in this like industrial place that no one really lives in um but all of that is a container for something that's very wild um and sort of primitive, which is just this outpouring of violence and control, right? So there's this interesting kind of um, need to be like, well, what I'm really interested in is, is this, is, is, is ultimately a very uncontrolled, untamed sort of primitive feeling of, you know, needing to dominate, needing to be violent, but within this kind of cage of, well, it's, it's sort of acceptable because my uniform is clean and because I like, you know, I have this timekeeping obsession and everything's just so, and I live in this kind of machine world. So it's this sort of like um, veneer or cage that like maintains this, what is ultimately a very kind of uh, chaotic and violent approach to, to the world and to dealing with people. Um, and I think that just represents sort of an interesting, you know, study and contrast. Um, and, and in a way is, is emblematic of 
of fascism. So there's a, there's a scholar of fascism called Jeffrey Herf who wrote this book called Reactionary Modernism. And it's all about how the weird thing about fascism and nationalism is that it's a very backward looking ideology in the sense that it has this romantic vision of like, you know, this pure ethnic group and it wants to restore it and all that stuff. And it plays on the mythology of like, you know, the, of the society that was and fairy tales and so on. But it uses technology a lot in order to, in order to achieve that in order to maintain control. And so it's this interesting duality between modernism and technology and preciseness and this much more kind of ancient primal urges. I just was reminded it, it's funny because you talk about the the sort of covering up of this like wild thing that's inside. I mean you could also make the same distinction between the fact that he takes care of the watch so much but that is, it's ironic because the watch itself is – is just a symbol. It does not function at all. It is broken on the inside, but that it, if, it's, if it is polished up enough and kept taken care of, that it will still serve as a reminder and have a sort of totemic power um, similar to the captain. Well, I'm also wondering too now if like he he denies that, uh, that story of his father because it like makes it, it like almost gives him like emotional attachment to the watch right it's like a very emotional thing rather than him like being perceived as like calculated and meticulous so it's like this um, almost like an emotional tethering like that could make him seem weak sure in a way and it also is a sort of reminder of mortality. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, there's, I mean, maybe it's just because I've been playing a lot of Assassin's Creed lately, but there is a sort of, <laughs> there's that like glory of dying in battle. It's, you know, he's not, he doesn't think he's going to Valhalla as a place, but there, that sort of idea about like the glory of dying in battle is like the best thing and that you will live on. I was going to say, he shouts at one of his comrades during the battle. He says, this is the only decent way to die. Uh, there was also a famous quote from Horace, a uh, dulce et decorum est, like it's honorable and pleasurable to die of one's country. And there was a poem around the same time, movie set, about how that was all a lie, basically. It's it's like a reminder of his mortality as well. And um, there is this sort of uh, another theme of uh, religion, obviously, that he, he sort of wants to live on and views himself as with almost like godlike power. Um, and that in this world, at least, he is, he is the one that is in control. I mean, you shouldn't have to worry about your bodies because God has already saved your souls. But while you're on this plane of existence, we will control what happens to your body. Um, and obviously the sort of co-opting of of the priest and using the sort of Roman Catholic um, status to legitimize your authority and, and the co-opting of religion is, is extremely common in fascist ideology. Um, and you see a lot of that symbolism in the scenes with the, the pale man as well, which uh, I believe Del Toro specifically said is, is a sort of symbol of the way that the church itself um, can sort of, it has this full plate before them, but decides to devour the children um, and sort of eat them up and consume them, going back to that uh, sort of, cons uh, that consuming theme that we talked about before um and that he himself didn't even write it to sort of make that point about the catholic church but that he as i believe he i believe he's a lapsed catholic um has just said like you know once a catholic always a catholic and you can't get away from those themes that are so embedded in into society and thinking about you know vidal and his association with sort of this life and death thing you know his his version of continuing on and, you know, sort of eternal life since, you know, fascism is usually sort of ambivalent in its relationship with religion. On the one hand, it wants to kind of use it to legitimize itself. But on the other hand, it's a, it's another loyalty that it doesn't necessarily want its victims and subjects to have, you know, away from the nation, away from the state. Um, Vidal's means of continuing his life forever is through his son. And, and so his son becomes sort of everything to him. All of, you know, his decisions are oriented towards, you know, my son will know the hour of my death and the means of my death. And the ultimate cutoff for him from his continuing life is that his son will not know his name, will not know anything about him. And, you know, even Vidal's name, Vidal comes from the Latin word for life. So 
you know, just everything about this character is about this odd obsession with eternal life and his own continuance, despite his sort of supposed commitment to Franco's Spain. The font says something similar when he's giving out to Ophelia at the end of the film, when he's saying, you disobey me, he's saying, you're going to die like a human, you're going to age like one, and eventually you'll be out of everyone's memory. Like, there's something similar for both Vidal and the Fawn, two people demanding obedience of others. Yeah, and they both seem to suggest that, like, what's really important is not the life that you live, but the life that other people perceive you as having lived, and 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 the sort of mythology of, of life, right? Because uh, to reference what... Um, you know, Alex has said, and I think other people have already said, right, the, the big glory for fascism is to die a good death. It's not really, it's not to live your life. Um, it's to sacrifice yourself for this state or for, you know, some kind of racial thing, um, some kind of larger collective mythology, um, and then to be perceived as having been glorious in doing so. Um, and so the, the, the sort of big question there is like whether the remembrance um that the fawn is talking about is the same kind of remembrance or lack thereof, or the importance of being remembered is the same kind of importance um, as the one that Vidal attaches. And I'm not sure. I, I kind of have this, as I said earlier, vague notion that it's somehow subverting um, the kind of story that Vidal is telling about obedience and being remembered and whatever, because it's focused on um, Ophelia and her specific life as opposed to for some larger collective goal. But it's a, the left a bit ambiguous, and perhaps that's deliberate. I think the entire film is kind of ambiguous. There's always like a lot of problematizing. Like you can think these two worlds exist at the same time, but then the captain at the end of the film he looks and he sees Ophelia on her own, not talking to the fawn. But also at the same time, he's quite drugged up, so he could be hallucinating. There's always kind of like a double think. Like you don't exactly know what is supposed to be real and isn't. Like some of the items Ophelia takes, they have a presence in the physical world. Like the mandrake root is real, seemingly, but then it's thrown to the fire. You don't know if the sounds are real because only Ophelia hears them. And that could have, when her mother, like, you know, keels over, that could have been like labor induced by stress or by fear. That could just be a coincidence. So you never really know. It's always so hard to tell. I think that's kind of part of the whole thing. Like Guillermo de Toro, there's no one authoritative narrative or view. There's just a multiplicity of things happening. And there's people like Vidal trying to force the world into one nice, clean narrative while it just won't conform to that at all. Yeah, and there's the suggestion that all of these are, that, that the only real invalidity is, are the people who try to force it into one thing. Um, but otherwise, many realities can exist at once. This, this world that Ophelia experiences, which, as you say, we don't really know whether it's, it's real or not. The world that her, the, I guess the world of adults um, that, 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 to contrast it with, um, that also exists at the same time and it's ambiguous, like with the mandrake root or, you know, the way that the fairies turn from whatever that, like stick insects or something, um, into, into fairies and back again and this kind of ambiguous quasi postmodern sort of fluidity between worlds and, and the kind of meta commentary of that is just not trying to force perceptions of the world or what is into a box. Yeah, and like the fairies originally start off as stick insects. Then Ophelia shows them a picture of a fairy and they change to suit her preferences. Yeah, she shows the fairy the book and then the fairy changes. Or the stick insect changes. And that it's all very kind of perception driven rather than based on anything that we can concretely kind of nail down. Um, which obviously like has a lot of tie in with the general like traditions of like magical realism, um, which is like a whole, you know, genre of that encompasses a lot of famous stuff, stuff um, from like Salman Rushdie and very, I mean, it's a very Latin American kind of a genre of magical realism uh, with people like Borges and Marquez. And I imagine that somehow made its way into Del Toro's way of thinking about fairy tales in general as, as these kinds of, as this kind of thing that's not, not untrue or true, but a kind of way of seeing the world. And, and importantly, it's a psych kind of psychological thing about how we relate to the experiences that we've got, right? To what extent are the things that Ophelia is, is, is this whole fawn world, um, her way of interpreting or experiencing what's going on around her? To what extent is it mirroring what's going on around her and has its own reality and it's just a reflection of what's, of what's actually happening in this fascist place that she's in and it's all a bit messy.
Borges wrote a, a book, a collection of stories called Labyrinths, which is a, obviously a big influence on Pan's Labyrinth. So you've got stories like The Garden of Forking Paths and The Library of Babel um, and things like that that are literally all about the power of a labyrinth and what it means to sort of delve into something like that and get lost and have to choose between multiple different paths, which leads to the notion of choice that you raised earlier, Natalie. Well, earlier, Akiva explicitly raised the issue of sort of being at a crossroads and the way that, you know, Ophelia has to navigate all this world and the, the sort of liminal space she's constantly in. And, you know, I mean, a labyrinth is sort of a series of crossroads just arranged yeah. in a, a maximally <laughs> I mean, confusing way. Yeah, the fawn <laughs> gives, the, gives her the book of the crossroads. So, And also the whole device of, um, you know, her drawing these doors with chalk. Um, and so there's like entrances into other places and breaks with what is supposed to be like a continuous, what was supposed to be a contained space at any given point, you know, so she can always enter this room or leave another where you wouldn't think she would be able to, um, but she can because of the, the whole chalk device. Um, and, and that, and, and it, and you get this kind of ambiguity about whether she has in fact left or entered a room. So like when she comes back from the pale man chamber and she slams the, trap door down um and then there's this sound um this like sort of thudding sound and you're not sure whether it's the pale man trying to get through the door that she's just closed or it's just sounds from outside um and it, it, it kind of retains this kind of transitional um confusing quality so i was curious if any of you had any thoughts on the issues surrounding ophelia's father her you know biological father because she says to Carmen at the beginning, or not Carmen, to Mercedes at the beginning of the movie that he died in the war. But Carmen at the, you know, sort of big dinner party banquet scene says he made uniforms and then just died. And the two women at the banquet sort of imply that it's uh, suspicious, almost, that she and Vidal met after her husband died um, almost implying that maybe there's some sort of, you know, David and Bathsheba thing going on, or maybe Vidal had some hand in her first husband's death or something like that. But I wasn't totally sure whether that was what was going on or just, you know, them sort of, I don't know, needling him for the sake of it. What do you think? I, I hadn't thought about it until you raised it because I, I was just like, oh, yeah, he died in the war. People die in wars all the time, even <laughs> if they're not the ones fighting. But I think specifically the fact that he made uniforms and now that we've dissected his his respect for the uniform that you could certainly see that like if someone treated it the wrong way or didn't do it precisely how he liked, how he would simply just either – in an indulgent way or just telling someone else to be like, okay, we're going to get rid of this guy and I, you know, to the victor goes the spoils, I get his wife because he right. views her as an object in that way. Yeah, I do. I do agree that like in that, in that scene, it was like very like, like sketchy. And then he was also the Captain Vidal was what after she was telling the story of like how they met it was like he didn't he didn't want to talk about it C again like because it made him seem human like because uh she was saying how like oh you know we met um and like then we met back up a year later and then he was like oh she doesn't know how to like act in company so like please disregard what she's saying it was all very it was very strange <laughs> so i could see how you like how i can see where there's like hmm this seems a bit sus <laughs> I thought the act and company thing was another of the kind of like everything these these raw emotions need to be contained kind of mo yeah mode, right so it's the same as having a crisp uniform but being very violent underneath and it's just kind of like we can't let it let it out let people see I mean, basically we can't let people see our human vulnerability um whether that's for like dark urges like violence or love um and he needs to be like this controlled machine all the time um in order to function and like we all we all in com polite company know that that we can't like let out our let out our vulnerabilities because that would be like a betrayal of how things are supposed to be but fascism is also all about aesthetics and it's all about kind of a, a stylishness of violence and making it romanticized and glorious and have a big narrative to it that might not really be there but they say it anyway and so when I first saw the part when he said he um, 
his dad didn't have a watch. One of my thoughts was maybe he's just, it's a little lie to him. It's a myth he makes up for himself to give his life more meaning. It seems like that's a large part of fascism because as a philosophy, it kind of really rejected the enlightenment vision of reason and rationality. And it was much more with the will and the passions and kind of a primordial self that relies on pure instinct and violence. Like Vidal, he's not like a very scholarly type guy, but he's a intellectual nonetheless because he can read people and he can go off of instinct and he can go through human nature. So I think one thing I think Guillermo de Torm actually talked about himself was that fascism is very appealing to a lot of people because of the way it portrays itself. And it's scary how many people are actually complicit in it. Like there's a certain degree to some of the characters in the film on the Franco, uh, the Franco side of the war, like they turn their, their eyes away from all the things happening in front of them. They see the cruelty and they kind of just accept it. Some of the fellow soldiers, they're obviously not the same level of evil as Vidal, but they still kill people who are trying to surrender. They still kill the wounded, but they just look away while, while they do it. There's a certain level of like Hannah Arendt's idea of the banality of evil that a lot of them just don't make choices anymore, but that's part of fascism. It's about assuming yourself to the will of another person. And now for the time in the show where we get to share all of the other things that we've been enjoying with our time at home. This is Locked In. So, Akiva, Paul, Alex, what else have you been enjoying with your time at home? So, sort of on the same, you know, collection of things of just children and anxiety and obedience, disobedience, horror, uh, the movie We Need to Talk About Kevin, I think, was uh, excellent. And, you know, it's about two hours of the most anxiety inducing thing I have ever consumed. But it stars John C. Riley and Tilda Swinton. They're both incredible in it. And I really enjoyed it, even though it, it is uh, a little bit of uh, an ordeal to get through. I think it's a superb movie. I remember reading the book for that, and it was genuinely terrifying and extremely creepy and unsettling oh, and the book was quite long so it was like the movie is two hours but the book was like 10 <laughs> uh, i've been on a weird like apocalypse binge so i've been watching sunshine and 12 monkeys sunshine is huh. about the sun is dying and there's like a mission to try and restart it basically with a nuclear bomb and 12 monkeys is about time oh, travel to stop a new bubonic plague very grim altogether Mine is mine is a little. I guess it it somewhat keeps with the existential slash the the existential themes or the sort of quasi nihilist themes because I've been rewatching. I I rewatched the past seasons of Rick and Morty and then watched the most recent season. Um, so I just did like a massive Rick and Morty binge, um, which obviously has a lot of stuff about whether the reality that you're inside of means anything compared to all the other realities that exist and what's important and all that stuff. Um, and then in addition to that, which in a totally, I guess in a different vein, although maybe there's ways to connect it, I've been listening to, um, there's a comedian that I like a lot named James Acaster, um, who has a very kind of surrealistic, kind of awkward style that I guess implicit, has sort of implicit kind of existentialism to it. Um, anyway, he has a, he has a book called James A. Cassius Classic Scrapes, and it's basically a bunch of stories about how he got into like a ridiculous jam, um, because he made some really dumb decision, um, that are very funny and have kind, some of them are, are less of a, are less sort of horrible and tragic, and some of them are, are quite cringy and awkward, um, or sad. And so they, it's a kind of interesting, very funny tale just about someone getting themselves into all kinds of uncomfortable situations. Um, because they were awkward or because they made some silly choice or whatever. For me, I, I just watched that, um, I think it is, it was it the tomorrow war. It's that new movie that's on Amazon prime. Um, I mean, it, it was fine to watch. It's not a very good movie. Um, <laughs> it was fine to watch. I mean, like it, <laughs> one it of those movies those... that you wouldn't need sound and you'd be like, yeah, whatever. Well, like, well, no, you would definitely need sound, but, um, it was one of those where like the, I mean, it, there was a lot like some action and then, I mean, it also had Chris Pratt in it. So like that helps, <laughs> but like, it wasn't, it wasn't actually a good movie. <laughs> um, so, 
I, I don't really know if I recommend that or not, but <laughs> it's free. But it's, I did I, watch it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I watched it. I did finish it. Um, so I watched that. And then I also, I'm reading The Nightingale right now, which is another, I'm back in my World War II historical World War II fiction, fiction. books. Got to yep. get that historical fiction <laughs> in there. We're back. Back to it. Um, but this one is about a um, girl that is uh, helping airmen from the british um who um like crashed down in spain or not in spain in france and then she's helping them cross the mountains in spain in order that to get to them to the british consulate so away from the germans um it's good so far and i don't know i don't know what's next on my list i do um i do really want to watch the expanse because like at least five people have recommended it to me now. So I think that might be like my next long watch. Um, just because it's like it's like my sweet spot for for TV shows. Like that kind of genre is very, very uh entertaining to me. So we'll see if I get that started before our next recording. <laughs> uh well, I have really been going into, you know, a deep existential kind of dark uh watch as well. I've been watching or or I'm just uh, wanting to start Ted Lasso, um, <laughs> obviously a very dark, uh, brooding, <laughs> brooding show. Um, I, I've heard good things. I've heard really great things. And I remember when they came out with the promos for the like Premier League on NBC and they did just like a little like commercial with Jason Sudeikis as Ted Lasso. And I thought that was hilarious. So I'm I'm kind of excited for uh for the show um and now that i got on somebody's apple tv um i am happy to uh to watch that i also have really been enjoying the podcast dead eyes um it's hosted by this guy named connor ratliff who uh you probably don't recognize him if you saw him he's had like bit parts and a lot of you know things here and there but he was a writer on the chris gethard show so they're sort of very funny alt comic um and it's a series that he hosts and writes about how 20 years ago he got cast in the hbo miniseries band of brothers and he was he was like a bit part. And then right before he was supposed to film uh, Tom Hanks, who was directing the episode he was in, uh, basically got him fired. Uh, and they <laughs> said that the, he, the, the story is he was about to go. And then they said, Tom Hanks saw your audition. He's having second thoughts. He says you have dead eyes. And that has <laughs> oh haunted gosh. and it has haunted him <laughs> for it, it has haunted him for 20 years. And so this podcast is him being like talking to other like funny sometimes famous people um lots of comedians you'll recognize and being like did you have an audition or a job that you had that you almost got and it got taken away from you or when you were really disappointed how did you deal with that and also there's like the sort of imp like subtle thing of like maybe if i can audition for tom hanks one more time um <laughs> i don't even have to get cast in anything i just want to know why he said i had dead eyes <laughs> um and it's like oddly touching and like really heartwarming and about like persevering and dealing with like businesses and and success and what it means to sort of be fulfilled but is also just so funny and ridiculous um because he he just has this sort of he he gets cast in roles with things like pathetic man uh that's the kind of character sort of character actor that he is um uh so he kind of leans into like what it means to be someone who gets cast in roles that with names like that um so i i really think people uh would enjoy dead eyes thanks for listening as always, the best way to get more Pop and Lock content is to follow us on Twitter. You can find us at the handle at Pop and Lock Pod. That's Pop, the letter N, Lock with an E like the philosopher, Pod. Make sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen as well. We look forward to unraveling your favorite show or movie next time. Pop and Lock is produced by me, Landry Ayers, and is co-hosted by Natalie Dowzicki. We're a project of libertarianism.org. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.